these are uh, this important to understand where these bodies are with the standardization of 5G. Um, in terms of the uh, standards, the work on 5G actually started in 3GPP uh, around 2015 with a study item. Um, I was at that time very much involved in that um, uh, as part of a Samsung team. Uh, we are now in something called release 17 of 5G. So uh, basically, TGPP uh, creates updates of the technology, and these are uh, releases. Uh, so release 14, release 15, release 16, release 17. Now, the first phase of 5G, which was uh, release 15, this really was focusing on uh, developing technologies and then products which offers faster mobile broadband. So uh, as a reference, 4G offers a one gigabit per second peak data rate. So that, that's the maximum achievable data rates download from, from 4G. 5G is aiming to provide 20 gigabit per second. Uh, at the moment, we can uh, get up to 700 maybe megabit per second uh, and so on for users but the ultimate aim is, is 20 gigabit per second so 20 times faster than 4g so the first phase of 5g was focusing really on how we can improve the technology to offer that sort of a very fast broadband but uh, from release 16 and i will discuss this a little bit more because that is very relevant to this talk uh, one of the big differences between 5G and previous generation of mobile communication is that while the previous generations were focusing on uh, starting with, with uh, 2G, 1G, 2G, and 4G, 5G, focusing on uh, voice and, and then uh, towards data and uh, um, video, audio, 5G is really focusing on expanding the connectivity into new sectors. These sectors are called the verticals, such as manufacturing, such as automotive, such as health, uh, such as agriculture. So it's really uh, the big ambition of 5G is to be a network infrastructure for this sort of uh, 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 applications. Uh, so work on 5G verticals started in release 16. Uh, and the other area that 5G is also focusing is with the enabling network for the Internet of Things. So uh, these are being now developed in uh, TGPP in release 16 and now release 17 in order to enable this. Um, now, another uh, body is, is ITU, which, which harmonizes the spectrum for 5G across the board. Uh, and, and this was done in World Radio Conference 19, WRC 19 in 2019, where they basically uh, developed the global uh, allocation of, of radio spectrum, new frequencies for 5G. I will mention them in a minute. Now, that is 5G, but what, where we can expect actually 6G, and this is very important because uh, 5G was deployed in UK in 2019, for example. Uh, and uh, but the research actually started at least uh, at Samsung. We already started around 2012. So for the standard to be completed by roughly 2020, the research started already eight or nine years ago. Now, in terms of a 6G, the expectation is that uh, maybe around 2000. 25, 26, we will we start the first study item on 6G. Uh, so before that, there will be a lot of research uh, to develop the technologies. Then the 3GPP will uh, standardize this uh, starting from 2025, 26, so that by 2029, 2030, we will have 6G. Uh, commercially deployed globally. So expectation is that 6G commercialization starts in 2029-2030. Um, I'm happy to take any feedback at this moment, uh, just also checking that you can still see and hear my screen.
Um, so moving on. Um, just to mention something about the 5G uh, radio spectrum allocation. So this is the global allocation of spectrum for 5G. Uh, and I will um, mention this because there are some uh, quite a big differences between 4G and 5G when it comes to the radio spectrum that is 5G using. So basically the radio spectrum for 5G consists of low bands. Uh, these are sub gigahertz frequencies. These are the frequencies that that are very good for uh, Internet of Things. They have a, a they cannot support high data rates, but they can uh, have a long range. These are raw frequencies. Then we have a mid band around 3.5 gigahertz. This is the frequency that is uh, used for 5G currently in the UK. So the first deployment of 5G in most countries except US and Japan is in this mid band. These are very similar to what is we have already in 4G systems. Um, but the new, uh, very new thing about the 5G is 5G is using this ultra high frequencies called the millimeter wave frequencies. So roughly from 30 gigahertz up to 100 gigahertz. Now this is the first time that the mobile communication is being uh, done in these sort of very high frequencies uh, where um, you have a, a large amount of spectrum and therefore you're able to achieve uh, very high data rates. Now the frequencies are very high, so the range is shorter and they used to use very uh, sophisticated antenna technologies in order to achieve ranges uh, similar to say Wi-Fi or larger. So, so these are the new uh, frequencies that are being used in 5G. That's quite a disruptive feature of 5G communication, the use of millimeter wave frequencies. Uh, now moving on to sort of application areas of 5G and this also relates to uh, why uh, we are moving to new sectors when it comes to 5G, not sticking just to voice, video and uh, consumer market. Uh, so basically there are three categories. Uh, one is the enhanced mobile broadband, so the ability of 5G to offer much higher data rates than 4G. And this is an enabler for things such as augmented reality and virtual reality on mobile devices, ultra high definition videos, and also uh, massive gaming. Uh, and this is really focused on the consumer market. Uh, so uh, 5G handsets that are now available at some stage should be able to uh, support this sort of applications. But at the same time, 5G is offering uh, two new things. First of all, it offers ultra reliable and ultra low latency communication. Uh, ultra reliable means that the packet drop rates are, are extremely low, so 5G can guarantee this. Uh, low latency means that the reaction time to the 5G network is below one millisecond. So basically when you push a button on your 5G handset to control an industrial robot, the reaction time will be uh, around one millisecond. Uh, and this is supposed to support things such as uh, industry robotic automation, so remote uh, control of robots and other industrial uh, systems, tactile internet, and things such as e-health, telesurgery, and so on, as well as supporting uh, uh, autonomous vehicle communications uh, for um, autonomous driving and congestion uh, control and so on uh, in traffic and that sort of things. The, the third part is that the 5G is also aiming to basically uh, be, become the communication network that can support massive machine type communication. So basically the ability to connect a very large number of massive a million or more per um, square kilometer uh, sensors and actors through the 5G network and this has applications such as uh, smart meters, grids, uh, energy grids, e-health, wearable, connected sensors, logistic and remote sensing. 
So 5G also looking at this massive scale of connectivity. Uh, not all of this obviously will be available maybe at the same time. So these applications, they have different uh, use cases. So the first, uh, basically this enhanced mobile broadband, this is really uh, what we have now with 4G, but much faster. That is focusing on consumer market. On the other hand, this other uh, sort of ultra reliable, low latency and massive, massive machine type, they're focusing on vertical markets or emerging markets. Uh, the operators uh, uh, around the world, they have a problem that although the traffic on the mobile network is increasing exponentially, the revenue curves are staying flat. Uh, so even if you have 5G, it's not going to maybe improve your revenue. So they need to basically look at these new sectors for new applications and re new revenues. Just to emphasize that this is a study uh, done by Qualcomm, uh, commissioned by Qualcomm. Uh, this is looking at annual global economic outputs that 5G can enable. So this is not really directly 5G, but 5G can enable. What we see here that obviously there is a figure of 1.6 trillion uh, dollars, and that's by 2035, in information and, and communication. So that's the sort of a, a conventional, traditional area. But, but when you look here, their expectation is that in areas such as manufacturing, you could have a, a basically a annual global economic output enabled by five, just 4.7 trillion. So th these markets seems to really be becoming the dominant one once 5G is mature. So potentially by, say, 2025, uh, around that time. So that's, uh, uh, in a nutshell, a little bit on where we are on 5G. Uh, so uh, since a few years, or at least from last year, there are a lot of um, new concepts coming out about what will be 6G. And that makes sense because the research and development has to start early on. So we, we cannot wait until 5G is fully matured before we start to work on 6G. So the timing is right. Uh, so um, I just uh, used here as an example uh, some some uh, examples from industry. So Samsung and Huawei. So Samsung 6G Vision that came out in July 2020. I was involved in developing the 5G Vision. So it was interesting to see what the 6G Vision going to be. And this is Huawei's Internet 2030 Vision, which also includes 6G. Um, so basically, these are the sort of diagrams uh, that is that are uh, indicating the uh, differentiation between 5G and 6G. Now, one thing, if you look at them, they have in common. Uh, so there are common visions and, and there are differences is that uh, while 5G is supposed to support up to 20 gigabit per second data rates, peak data rates, the expectation is that we move with 6G to the era of terabit per second peak data rate. So that, that's sort of a common uh, feature of 5G. So that, that's that's one of the things. So terabit per second on ultimately on maybe mobile devices with 6G. Uh, there are obviously there are other uh, dimensions that 5G is uh, 6G is going to be different. So 5G is offering milliseconds. Uh, latencies 6G is, is expected to offer 0.1 millisecond latest latencies on the radio. Now you, you might think well I mean why do we need that sort of um, very high data rates of terabit per second? Um, so these are uh, two potential applications of a terabit per second mobile communication um, obviously, now with the lockdown and so on, we really see the, the, the need for more telepresence. So we are using Zoom, video and audio, but obviously we want a more immersive telepresence through holographic uh, communication. So if you look at the requirements for holographic communication, uh, 
when we go from 4K to 8K HD video that is going to be possible with 5G easily, then VR and AR, we move to hologram, then we may need about 4 terabit per second or up to 10 terabit per second uh, data rates to enable this sort of a fully holographic communications. The other example that, that is very much uh, sort of hotly discussed in industry and also academia is the idea of digital twins. Now, digital twins is very interesting because it's at the intersection between high performance computing, cloud computing, and mobile communication. The idea here is that we, are, we collect uh, on a um, second or second or millisecond per second data uh, from a physical object, in this scary car, or it could be an entire manufacturing plant that is then uh, fed into a, a digital replica or a digital uh, model simulation model that uh, does very high fidelity uh, real-time simulation of our uh, manufacturing plant or in this case a car uh, so that enables us to predict maybe failures do predictive maintenance uh, and, and, and so on uh, now I'm also considering things such as for a digital human basically if you're able through the in-body and on-body sensors we can uh, capture all the information about the vital signs of a human body uh, that we at some stage may be able to basically re replicate uh, the, uh, a human uh, also digitally uh, and basically to do that sort of things you also need uh, with 100 millisecond periodic updates of, of say in this case a car you may need uh, up to 0.8 terabit per second uh, data rate. So, so that sort of uh, is one of the areas that we may uh, we are looking into 6G rather than 5G. Um, now the other thing, and I'm coming back to this in terms of verticals. What is the idea here? Well, if you look at the history of of uh, mobile communication, 3G was the first generation of mobile system that introduces uh, mobile broadband. So 3G was the first one. Now, 3G was not extremely successful, but really mobile broadband becomes a main feature of, of mobile systems in 4G. Uh, the same potentially with verticals. So at the moment, uh, the industry is focusing very much on developing uh, 5G technologies that are suitable for areas such as manufacturing, such as automotive, uh, such as health. Uh, so this is going to be matured in, in 5G. Um, and, uh, but then there are new verticals that are coming, uh, and these are not still um, uh, completely understood because the requirements are very different from mobile broadband. So really we need to understand the requirements in terms of data rates, latency, reliability, areas such as robotics, uh, potentially people are talking about uh, flying platforms and, and health. So these are some areas that will start in 5G, but then it will extend in 6G. Now, when we are looking at what is happening now is that thanks to 5G, we are getting manufacturing uh, ships, ports and others online. These are all becoming online. So they are all connected through 5G networks. Uh, either uh, to mobile operators networks or actually to the internet. Uh, so what will be the, the next thing once this uh, large manufacturing plants or robots become online, then what we can expect is that we can connect these through the internet. Now this is a, a very different internet than what we have now. We have now still uh, you know humans connecting through the internet. Uh, or we have IoT, Internet of Things, sensors with, with low data rates connecting to the Internet. But when you're talking about the Internet of Verticals, we are talking about manufacturing plants across the world being connected through the, uh, the networks. And this enables things such as people talking about manufacturing clouds. So basically, you will virtualize the entire manufacturing uh, plants uh, just uh, like like a sort of app, uh, 
So they, they can be loosely or tightly connected. They can be virtualized. You could uh, move to things such as on-demand manufacturing, uh, which means that uh, you could pick and choose uh, different parts of your manufacturing uh, from different um, virtualized manufacturing applications and then connect them uh, in real time in order to basically develop your uh, products. Uh, so that's one example. So people are talking about that. Uh, and the other one is, um, and this is an area I'm very interested in, that if you think of robotics, the robotic technology, robotic technology is, is just start to take off. It has a number of applications, manufacturing, in agriculture, in mining, in healthcare, in retail. So it's very specialized at the moment. In the future, we may have uh, robotic services that you basically connect through this new internet uh, and you're able to utilize them uh, as you require. There's a paper we have just submitted, uh, which I'm happy to share with you on this sort of vision of future internet. So this is this is uh, this is going to be a sort of a new internet because it's not connecting humans, it's not connecting things, but it's connecting entire manufacturing plants, it's connecting robots, ships, and so on. Uh, it, it's it's used for um, smart energy uh, and um, things such as um, such as um, pro consumers in in energy. So producers and consumer of energy. So it's a very, very new internet that we can have with 6G. Um, this is uh, just drilling down a little bit in, in going into the robotic communication. I'm very fascinated by this. Why is that? Uh, because robots basically, when they uh, have, um, when they have the ability to communicate uh, with each other, with the environment and with humans, they could obviously consume a huge amount of data. Uh, first of all, robot-robot robot communication does not need to be just limited to voice, data, and vision. Uh, it could uh, communicate the entire scene, a multimodal sensory, and uh, other um, other things such as holographic communication or totally new form of communication. Because we are not talking about human-human communication. These robots can basically create their own ways of communication and surely they can consume much more data that uh, humans can use, so potentially up to terabit per second. Also, uh, in robotics, there is a very strong push in terms of virtualizing robots, meaning that the, uh, the, the kind of a central processing unit uh, of the robots, these are gonna be, because of the availability of fast networks, be run in the cloud. So you will have robots that are connected through 5G or 6G to the cloud, and, and that will reduce the cost that enables uh, virtualization of robots. Um, so I want to pause at this stage and see if there are any questions already for me, and then I move to the final part of my talk. No questions at the moment, thank you. Excellent, and may I ask our chairman how I do with time? Uh, I think we're absolutely fine, thank you very much. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. So moving on, I just want to um, focus on some of the key technologies uh, beyond 5G, uh, starting with artificial intelligence. Now, if you look at the timelines for AI, uh, obviously with, with things, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to you 5G standardization work started in 2015. Uh, now, maybe around 2014, 2013, that was the time where uh, AI started a bit earlier, started to tick up, uh, take off uh, with deep neural networks, AlphaGo, and so on. <coughs> Now, so the timing of basically this huge expansion or explosion in the AI was, was very parallel when, when the um, 5G standards are being developed. We were aware of this, but uh, it was just too late. 
in in order to and, and AR was not uh, still um, sort of the, the mainstream for for at least in the telecom sector. So the 5G standards were not influenced by AI that much. Now, in more recently, so about a year ago, the 3GP has started some initial work on implementing some aspects of uh, machine learning and AI into 5G. Uh, but moving ahead towards 6G, we, we, we are very definitely are expecting a huge impact on AI and machine learning in mobile communication systems. The sort of a low hanging fruit at the moment is, uh, and I'm involved in some, uh, some of this is uh, to use basically AI to automate the operation of mobile communication systems, still very manual. So this is really about automation of the operation of, of systems. It's about how you can use machine learning, for example, to predict churns in mobile, uh, mobile customers, that sort of areas. That's part of this, but it's not really uh, a part of the 5G core technology. My, my team and, and, and some colleagues, we are looking at uh, how we can actually, what we call it, deep AI, we embed the AI into next generation mobile communication systems. Now, there are many different places where you can embed AI. We can embed AI in the radio network, that's a radio access network. So I will uh, give you an example of that. We can uh, embed AI into the core of the mobile communication system. That's the, really the, the brain of, of mobile communication system that uh, do, does things such as uh, mobile handover, uh, security, uh, SCN, NFV. Uh, we can also consider AI in the what, what's called the transport layer. I will give an example of this. But I think it's also very interesting to look how, for example, AI can percolate through to things such as the the transport network, the TCP, IP, uh, and so on. Uh, so I, I just give you some example of our recent work. Um, so one area that AI could be quite revolutionary uh, in my view is um, basically if you look at the classical design of a, a, a digital communication system, so basically what we have, we have a source uh, which could be, uh, obviously this is, could be video, audio or whatever, uh, and this is already digitalized. Then there are a number of signal processing uh, units that are uh, there between that source and the antenna. So we have source coding, channel coding, modulations until we go to the RF transmitter. This is called the baseband processing or the physical layer of mobile communication, and then at the receiver is the same. Um, now, in the standard, these are all being developed by engineers uh, in industry in order to develop, say, 5G technology or 6G. Uh, now, these are optimized, uh, these uh, blocks, for uh, based on, on a knowledge of, of a for example, the radio channel and so on uh, for particular applications. Now, these are signal processing blocks and once they are standardized by 3GPP, they are fixed, they cannot be changed. We need a, an, another release maybe two or three years later in order to enhance them. How about replacing this whole thing by a, a machine learning block? So the idea is if we can replace this a baseband unit of a radio communication by a machine learning block. Now, if we can do that, there are interesting things happening because ultimately the aim of a communication system that we have a source, we, we are sending the data over a channel, we want to receive this with the, with the least error uh, <coughs> in, in the received data. So that's what these blocks are doing. Now, if we basically are able to do this and we use something called the autoencoder which is a deep neural networks first of all because it's a machine learning block it can use data to improve its performance so it's a data driven uh, and it's an end-to-end -end learning solution and it also can change 
sort of instantaneously or quite quickly to changes in the environment, including the channel. So, for example, uh, mobile systems will be used a lot in indoors, maybe in, inside factories with metallic walls and, and so on. That's very different when you're using the same system, say, in the centre of London for, um, for, 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 for mobile broadband. So this sort of system can actually adapt to the environment. There's a pioneering work actually done that inspired us for Ocean Oidis, and there's a quite a lot of work now going in this area. One area that we looked at is how we can uh, basically use this uh, when we are dealing with interference. Now, in mobile communication system, interference is a very big uh, challenge because typically, say, Vodafone or BT, they use the same channel everywhere. And when you're at a, a dense spot, such as the uh, center of London, <coughs> interference becomes a, managing that interference becomes a big problem. The uh, Wi-Fi deals with this by using uh, orthogonal channels, but in, in, uh, in mobile systems, because of very sophisticated scheduling mechanism, we use the same channel, uh, but we divide the resources. Uh, so we wanted to see if we can tackle this uh, using this uh, auto encoder. So what? So this is a demonstration here. This is a system model. So basically, what we have here is a, a large number of pairs of transmitter and receivers. Now these are not the conventional ones, but these are replaced by this deep neural network autoencoder. Uh, they transmit at the same time, at the same frequency, so they cause interference to each other. Uh, and we wanted to see if it's they are able to adapt uh, by learning in order to reduce the interference. Uh, and in fact, they can do that. Uh, and then we compare this with the conventional approaches, so not using the autoencoder. And indeed, uh, when we are at high interference, especially, we get quite a large gain from this sort of a AI-enabled uh, systems. They basically develop their own consultations. Now, this is uh, quite uh, complex. So we looked at sort of centralized approach where uh, all the nodes can cooperate. Uh, this is a case where each of these pairs is not actually cooperating, so it's, it's fully distributed. Uh, and in this case, we've, we, we needed to uh, sort of do some fixing in order to converge. But this is an example of, this is the constellation. So this is basically the, the constellation of the modulation points <coughs> of a two, excuse me, two user system. And what we see here is that basically through learning, they will change and adapt their constellation in order to minimize interference. Now, this is an area which probably is going to have some, uh, some there's a long road, but it's probably one of the areas that can AI can play a role in, in 6G in terms of a radio network design. This is another example. This is a very um, hot area at the moment in uh, 5G and beyond 5G. So basically, um, and I think that um, that also is an interface between more computer science and uh, mobile communication, that if you look at a mobile system, you typically have a sort of a base station, so a 5G base station or a Wi-Fi access point. Now, the signal processing digital signal processing that is done in these, these are can be done also on the cloud. There's no need to have that unit in the system itself. So basically what, what, what people do is to, that they take that signal processing away from the base stations into uh, a cloud and that can then be virtualized. So this is called virtual radio access networks. Now the benefit of this is that then you can share resources. So if, if a base station, Wi-Fi base station, uh, access point or a, a radio base station is actually not doing any digital signal processing, that resource can be shared. Uh, and you can also remotely control all of this. This would require very fast networking uh, between the, the radio head and, and the sort of a 
the cloud unit, uh, latencies could be extremely low. You may need up to, uh, as as low as one uh, nanosecond latency for extreme cases or microsecond latencies, so microsecond latencies and very high data rates for this link between the radio heads and the cloud. Um, now, what we have been doing is that we are able to basically you can use machine learning in order to basically do this in a dynamic well. So you will not uh, put all the functionalities in the BBU, but we may split the functionalities based on the requirements. Now, this is uh, something called uh, VRAM, so virtualized and virtual radio access network. Now, there is another area that is very uh, topical now, it's called ORAN. Uh, and ORAN is, uh, what is the difference is that with ORAN, you have exactly the same architecture, but the interface between this radio unit and the cloud is open. Uh, so companies such as Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, etc., they have closed interfaces, means that you're not able to basically change this as you wish. But ORAN, which is uh, driven by a number of companies, including Facebook, these interfaces are open, which means that basically in the future you're able to develop your own uh, 5G or 6G, uh, you know, standard networks, really. You can change it, and, and this is very uh, interesting to operators, you know, to be able to make uh, these systems fully virtualized and with full open interfaces. Uh, now I'm, I'm moving now a little bit more on the radio side and then I come back uh, to the internet, which also greatly interests me. Now um, I mentioned that uh, 6G, one of the, uh, one of the uh, basically pillars, if you like, of 6G is going to be terabit per second mobile connectivity or towards that. Now you might ask yourself where how we can go from gigabit per second to terabit per second in 6G. Now telecom engineers very much look at the Shannon's capacity formula for that. So Claude Shannon, uh, a hero of, of, of uh, telecom engineering and, and communication who developed the mathematical theory of communication in 1948 as well as uh, developing the information theory. So and the sh uh, in a nutshell, it says that the capacity, so really the data rates that is uh, you can achieve, uh, is proportional to the bandwidth. So bandwidth of course translates to the amount of radio spectrum you have in wireless communication and logarithmically proportional to the S. So that's a signal divided by noise ratio. Uh, so what, what that says in a nutshell, and obviously when you have things such as MIMO uh, or others, there's a four factor in this, but 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 that, that not doesn't always work. So basically what it says that if you want to increase capacity, if you increase the bandwidth by about a factor 10, you get 10 times increase in capacity. But if you increase the signal to noise by bringing the uh, your um, your um, base station closer to the user, so by densification, for example, that only gives you logarithmic advantage. So the most straightforward way to uh, improve uh, increase data rates in in wireless communication is to have more bandwidth. Now, how do you get bandwidth? Well, it's sort of no-brainer that. If you are below a, a gigahertz, you have a maximum of one gigahertz bandwidth. So if you want to have more bandwidth, you have to go to higher frequencies. And that is exactly what happened in 5G. So in 5G, we are using this millimeter wave frequencies between 28 and 70 gigahertz. So that offers us a much more bandwidth. And therefore we can achieve this 20 gigahertz per second connectivity. So, if you want to go to 6G, what do you have to do? Well, we just have to go to even higher frequencies. So below 100 gigahertz, and we are hitting something called the terahertz gap. So these are loosely speaking frequencies uh, higher than 100 gigahertz, so it's what terahertz. Uh, so we need to do terahertz communication. Um, now there are a number of 
research challenges associated with terahertz communication. These are at the moment being considered. They are not all solved. Uh, so I mentioned them here. One challenge that we have been focusing on the antenna technologies for terahertz communication. And why is that important? I just use an illustration to, to show that why it's important. This is a uh, courtesy of my ex-colleagues in Samsung. These are actually uh, trials in London uh, uh, using mobile uh, millimeter wave systems in 28 gigahertz. This is uh, in central London to offer from a base station a gigabit per second connectivity to a, a Wi-Fi access point inside a home. So that's a, like a fiber replacement solution. It's called fixed wireless access. Now, in order to do that, if you go up to frequencies because of the pass loss, your your signal strength is is reduced by uh, squared on the frequency. So if you go from 10 uh, megahertz to 100 megahertz, your signal strength will be reduced by 100 times. Now to combat this, so in this case, if you go from 2.8 gigahertz to 28 gigahertz, you have a 100 times reduction in signal strength. To combat that, you need to use very focused beams. So this is called beam forming. So you have to really beam your mobile broadband to the user. Uh, and that would require uh, multi-antenna technologies. This particular uh, Samsung um, prototype uses 1,024 antennas. Now, in the 4G systems, typically we may have a few antennas, so this is really a, a big scale up in the antenna technologies. Now, if we go to terahertz frequency by the same mathematics, simple mathematics, you may need up to 100,000 antenna element. That's extremely challenging to miniaturize on, on devices. So, we are looking at some sort of a new approaches to the antenna technologies called metasurfaces. So what are meta surfaces? These are basically a surface which can be manipulated on the wavelength scale in order to change dielectric properties uh, on, on a kind of a sub wavelength scale. Uh, now using this, you, you could actually, uh, and this is uh, some of the work we are doing. We have been using liquid crystals. Liquid crystals or uh, their uh, dielectric properties can be changed uh, simply by changing the bio bias. And by doing that, you're able to basically uh, shape your electromagnetic wave that is incident on this as you like. So by changing this configuration of this liquid crystal, you could basically, uh, and this is quite, this uh, a, a sort of a difficult um, integer programming, in fact. So, so basically, you start with a desired shape for your beam forming and then you find what sort of configuration of the meta surface you need in order to achieve this. So these are examples of sort of terahertz beam forming using liquid crystal metal surfaces where we in this case we have used genetic algorithm in order to be able to find the patterns that matches a certain required beam forming. Now I'd like to uh, end up and, and this is an area I'm, I'm very interested more recently uh, I started my research at BT looking at the internet and then I moved to wireless. So I'm now sort of trying to come back to my origins. So uh, let's talk about a bit about internet evolution towards 6G. So basically, uh, when we are looking at this sort of future vertical applications, they are not best effort. They need ultra low latency, they need very low packet drops, extremely low, and also they need deterministic versus probabilistic services. Now the current internet is a, a is 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 a really a, and and you may argue about this, but it's it is a packet switched and it, it's a you cannot offer deterministic services. I'll, I'll discuss that a bit. So what we really need is is an internet that can offer this sort of uh, requirements. What we are seeing now is that uh, industry is moving away from internet. They are creating their own private networks where they can manage the latency, the um, through things such as slicing and private networks, the latency, the deterministic networks, uh, 
and so on. So if you really want to look at the next generation of internet, we need to look at uh, an internet that can offer this sort of uh, beyond this best effort towards deterministic networks. So there's a number of uh, work happening in industry. So ITF, uh, DeathNet working group, they are focusing on this deterministic networks, but they're focusing on, um, on, on not, not a multi-domain uh, networks, but uh, basically a network within a campus or an intranet uh, or uh, manufacturing. So this is not looking at a wide area deterministic network. ITU uh, has a working group that is looking at um, also uh, has proposal for high precision deterministic IP networks. So this is another ongoing work. So I think this is a, an ETSI, the European uh, Telecommunication Standard Institute, they working uh, on something called non-IP networking. So they want to move away from candidate network protocol technologies that could be an alternative to TCP IP. So there's a lot of work happening now driven by the need for uh, 5G in particular for this sort of vertical networks. And I think it's gonna be even more in 6G. Uh, this is just an illustration of what we mean by large-scale, <coughs> excuse me, deterministic networks. So basically, if you look at a traditional IP network and you plot the latency, you you may know the average latency, but the um, variance, so fluctuations in the latency, can be quite large. When we are looking at large-scale deterministic network, we need to be able to guarantee both the average latency and the, uh, the fluctuations around this are, are bounded. We cannot do that with IP networks, so digital really, and as well as not offering high reliability. So these are, I think, um, quite an interesting research question that are currently being considered. Um, I'm collaborating uh, in this particular area um, in some aspects of it with um, Huawei. Uh, and um, just so comes to the end of uh, my talk, uh, and I'm delighted to be here to uh, to discuss with you. Uh, so basically, research on concepts, technologies, and spectrum also for 5G has already started. So work on 6G technologies, uh, and the standardization is is likely to kick off industry standards in 2025 onwards in 3GPP and ITU. Now, when I was showing you my first graph, I, I looked at 3GP and ITU, but not ITF. I think what is happening now is that we see much more convergence that, you know, the 6G probably has, has going to have a, a lot more influence from um, the sort of a internet community, the cloud community. So some of the drivers for 6G are terabit per second connectivity, new verticals and artificial intelligence, of course. AI is going to be soon embedded everywhere, but the processing requirements are very heavy, and therefore a lot of this can be, again, virtualized th thanks to 6G networks. <coughs> um, as I mentioned, there are many candidate technologies are because I truly believe that there's a need for even closer collaboration between the electrical engineering and the computer science community when it comes to 6G. Uh, and these are some of the areas that I think are interesting to work together. AI and machine learning, open RAN, next generation internet. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of work starting to be done on quantum internet and quantum communication. Maybe this will be 6G or towards 7G. Uh, so to speak. So, so that's the uh, end of my talk. There's some acknowledgement to some of our industry collaborators from Samsung, Dr. Yu Wang, and Dr. David Lau from Huawei, and uh, some of my team here, uh, some references to our work. So thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I would be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Nakove. Uh, yes, I can see there are some questions uh, asked by our audience. Uh, uh, Mike Short asked a series of questions. Can I invite Mike to ask just 
uh, basically one question, because uh, I can see you asked about eight questions here. Which one is the one you want uh, uh, Mazia to, to, to answer most? Uh, can you hear your I'll speak now if you like. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, Mazia. Great overview. Uh, I asked a series of questions because there are clearly some competition issues when it comes to 6G. Can you describe a little bit about how you see uh, the, the Wi-Fi roadmap playing into 5G evolution and 6G? To what extent will Wi-Fi evolve to compete with 6G? Uh, yes, that, that, that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much for that. So obviously I focus on cellular technologies. We have now Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7, um, and so on. I, I mean, from a from personal view, I actually think that um, we are probably moving to a what I would call RAN agnostic uh, core networks. That, that's my thinking, uh, where the radio access network not necessarily is going to be a, a 3GPP. So it could be a, a mix and match of 3GPP. Uh, radio access network as well as Wi-Fi and other standards. So I think they're going to definitely have a, a very important role in, in 6G and that may also reduce the cost point for deployment for operators. So so I, 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 I think that that is definitely has a strong role to play uh, this sort of a run agnostic, uh, you know, the next generation. At least when it comes to applications such as uh, local localized applications such as private networks in campuses in manufacturing that sort of application maybe the wide area will still be you know the, still the domain of um, 3gpp uh, radio access networks mike uh, 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 do you want to ask another question out of your list uh, I'm happy to ask another question. In terms of energy, uh, you've mentioned it very briefly. One of the key issues that exists this year is that the UK is hosting the COP26 talks, and energy and climate change are key to that. How will telecommunications networks in the mobile space radically change the energy formula? Well, well, that that is uh, again an excellent question. I I wanted to put a bit more on energy. I I didn't, but I'm happy you you um, raised that question. Um, obviously, when 5G was developed, we were talking about a hundred times a reduction, I think, in energy consumption uh, at some stage. Now, um, now right now, um, there were a recent report was arguing that. Uh, maybe the consumption is, is actually going to be higher than 5G. Uh, when we add then AI to it, you, you may think, you know, it will be going up rather than going down. Um, I think one answer that people give here is that maybe we need to look at it as a, not just energy consumed by the telecom networks, but how, um, you know, um, the use of mobile communication, virtual presence and so on, actually reduce energy consumption in other areas. Uh, you know, a very obvious example is the commuting. And, you know, with this current home networking and so on, you can see that uh, the uh, mobile communication uh, and the communication in general could be an enabler for reducing uh, the cost, energy cost and uh, CO2 footprint in other areas. The other thing is that uh, if we look at uh, things such as um, the smart network and services, obviously, perhaps with 6G, we will put that uh, energy efficiency as a very strong KPI already from the start into, into the, uh, you know, the requirements rather than not being uh, a main one. So, yeah, I, I think that that's some, my, some of my thoughts on the energy side. Great. We have a, 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 a audience ask the question: What does blockchain fit into all this? 
Well, well, blockchain, I think, is, is extremely important when it comes to uh, especially distributed uh, Internet of Things systems. Um, in particular, I think that that's one of the areas where blockchain fits very well. Uh, there's also interesting work going on on kind of a, using blockchain in some of the security scenarios for 5G. I think one of the main areas in a sort of a uh, the future IoT applications. Great. We have another audience <laughs> ask an interesting question called Steve Knight. Uh, he says, "Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, very interesting." He asked. Uh, do you see uh, uh, any more future generations beyond 6G or uh, will incremental bandwidth returns eventually diminish and uh, we will settle on a G that is satisfactory for all applications? <coughs> well, well, that is a very interesting question. At some stage, people are saying that you know, 5G is going to be the end, there will be no Gs. Uh, but um, moving away from that, um, I mentioned to you this uh, Open RAN um, movement. Now, Open RAN is a very serious movement. It's supported by uh, major operators, in particular Vodafone. Where basically, we are moving away, but opening the interfaces to the radio access networks. So if you look at the um, mobile network, the core, uh, the core is already virtualized. You can, you know, if your computer is fast enough, you can run it on your PC, so to speak, uh, and you can change the software. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, so that's already open. But the radio part is not open yet. Now, with this open RAN, if that radio part also opens, you will end up in a situation that most of the uh, standard is uh, op uh, becomes an open standard at some stage, which means that you could uh, just as with the software, you could bring the new releases much faster and you can develop them yourself. So it could be that, you know, after 6G, we will see... Uh, uh, this, this sort of a, you know, uh, it may at some stage disappear in that sense that we don't see this very clear generation going on, but it's more a, a sort of software um, sort of upgrades that, that you're going to see. That's a possibility. Great. A uh, final question uh, uh, due to time limits. Uh, there is a question uh, asked by Ian Groves. Uh, he asked, who is going to build 6G networks? We have already seen that the commercial case of, uh, for 5G is struggling due to the investment requirement in baseline technologies, such as fiber in the ground. So who do you say driving the mass deployment of 6G? Uh, well, well, typically, uh, they are the vendors that are at the forefront of development. It was the same with 5G, so when we were researching 5G, the mobile operators were still deploying 4G. Uh, so, and that's what you also see that, you know, there are recent white papers from Ericsson, from Samsung, from Nokia, uh, from Huawei, others on, on 6G. So the next technology is so obviously uh, there's a driver. But in terms of market drivers, this is really a good <coughs> question. And um, I do some work uh, in Network 2020 with Telecom Italia. We really want to look at, you know, commercial use cases for for 60, what they are. Um, as I mentioned to you, the uh, uh, revenue for operators are flat, uh, so it's not increasing with the more data people are using. So these vertical sectors, the manufacturing, the mining, the agriculture, the health, you know, when we get this fully connected, uh, Industries, I think that's where the uh, the real value and driver for 6G could be. So we have new players coming like Bosch, Siemens, uh, and so on into this uh, mobile ecosystem that hopefully will drive it, the, the demand. Great. Is uh, there an opportunity to ask a question, please? 
Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, a quick one, very quick one. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so, um, Dr. Shazwa Babin, uh, Dr. Mazia, I think we worked together a very long time ago. I was doing my PhD in artificial intelligence about yes, seven years ago in, yeah, at King's College. Um, uh, thank you very much for your talk. And this kind of brings me back to my research topic back then. Um, I was basically looking at deep neural networks when they were just coming out. Um, my papers were you know, having a really hard time getting accepted in conferences back then. But I think nowadays it's all op opened up. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just going to ask you about um, artificial intelligence in 5G and um, coming 6G. Um, are we, is there a potential that, you know, machines are going to be intelligent um, enough to act on themselves? And uh, my actual question is, are we coming closer to the, the paradigm shift that we thought is going to change everything, cognitive radios, um, maybe just a little bit closer to um, get machines be intelligent enough to optimize their own parameters and be more efficient uh, with, with the resources. Yes, absolutely. I think some of the work we are doing now that I mentioned is actually looking to that sort of true cognition on, on devices uh, with these uh, autoencoders and deep neural networks. Right. The, the well, challenge, as uh, Energy mentioned, was energy consumption of these, these systems. Well, uh, 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 should we all thank our uh, speaker give us this wonderful uh, talk on 5G, 6G and how internet gonna catch up with all this wireless uh, communication. Thank you very much, uh, Mata. Maybe you can only hear my uh, applause, but uh, I'm sure uh, most of uh, you know, uh, audience will uh, very much share uh, this. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And I, as I understand, uh, this uh, talk is recorded. So perhaps we will make this uh, video available on YouTube. Uh, I mean, you, you should be able to see a link announced on our web page of the uh, uh, IST. And uh, some of you asked whether the slides will be available. Uh, I would assume if you uh, watch the video, the slides uh, will be shown uh, in the video. Uh, but of course, uh, I would assume you can contact uh, uh, Professor Nakovi to ask for a copy of the slides if you want. And uh, again, would, thank you would so professor much, be, would, would the professor be willing to uh, let us put uh, his slides on our web page? Sure, sure. I would be delighted to send you the PDF. Yeah, no problem. That's wonderful. Yes, if you'd like wonderful. to send and many it thanks to, from my uh, side. It was a real pleasure to speak with you. Great. Uh, uh, thank you all uh, very much. And uh, uh, all of you are welcome to, uh, if you are a, a DCS member, you are welcome you to much. stay online and uh, join our uh, ATM, uh, which will take place uh, following this talk. And uh, if you are not a, a DCS uh, member, if, or if you for any reason want to leave, you are uh, free to leave. Uh, but I really enjoyed this talk. and. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mazia, and uh, uh, have a good evening. And uh, 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 wish to see you more in future. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely delighted, and have a great AGM. Thank. Thank you. Thank you very much Thanks, once again. Thanks. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, now, let's see if I can just share the screen. What am I getting coming up? Okay, so uh, yes, you already uh, shared your screen with us, haven't you? Uh, that's uh, oh yeah, and I've got my agenda. Uh, draft agenda for the meeting. Yes, which is good. Uh, good. I can okay, see right. We well, have... go ahead, please. Go and see what we're going to say. I'm going to say that we have about 19 attendees uh, still online with us. Uh, 
I mean, if any of you are BSC member, if you want to participate in this uh, internet specialist group, you are very welcome to stay to, you know, uh, to join this AGM. And uh, if you are not a BCS member, uh, of course, uh, you might leave because uh, you might not be eligible to attend our meeting. So if you stay with us, we, we would assume you are a BCS member. Thanks. Well, in fact, the non-members are very welcome to contribute, uh, but simply not vote okay. when it comes to the voting point. Okay. No, we, we welcome uh, views from everybody as to what they'd like to see That's the group great. doing. Uh, um, well, case, yes. Please do stay and uh, uh, please do stay. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Right, well, I've put the agenda up on the screen. Uh, some of you will have had the up-to-date version because I sent out links. Uh, this was actually updated about four o'clock today because more information came in. Um, unfortunately, our previous chairman, uh, Phil, um, in fact, actually has uh, had to... Um, where, where's my screen got? I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to get those minutes. That's better, I hope. No, yeah, um, has uh, had to uh, re resign uh, due to the project, and so has our secretary. Um, so it's really left to me to sort of, uh, as treasurer, to take over and uh, act as temporary chairman, unless anybody's got any objections. Um, I've received no apologies for absence. Um, we, I circulated the minutes of the 2018-2019 AGM. Uh, I don't know whether you want to, whether I can actually. Let's see whether I can put them up on the screen. Um, I've got that many things on my screen at the moment. Uh, let's get rid of that, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Um, Yes, you can see the minutes of the last meeting. Um, I don't know whether anybody's got any uh, comments or criticisms of the uh, or ch corrections of the minutes. No, nope. nobody said anything. Um, so uh, I'll take them as read, and uh, I trust you'll approve them. If not, send me an email very rapidly. Right, we then come on to the question of reports from last year. And um, again, we're rather short because uh, neither Phil nor Jane have been able to do a report. Uh, you've seen uh, my report on the finances, mainly thanks due to uh, the COVID uh, situation. We've only actually had one meeting that's incurred any money, um, but we've had a, a, a couple of meetings that have been online which have cost absolutely nothing so we're well within the budget we originally was set um, I'm hoping during the forthcoming year we shall have some more active committee members and we should be holding some more meetings um, I'm particularly keen to hear from uh, members as to what they would like the meetings to talk about um, I'm very keen that we should perhaps concentrate to more towards what is happening at the user end of things, rather than some of the technical stuff that uh, is actually covered, covered by a number of the other specialist groups. Um, I think that's really all I've got in the way of a report. Um, she, have we had any questions? Because I'm too busy looking at this to notice if we've had any questions or comments. Uh, no, I don't have uh, any other comments. Right. Um, we had a questionnaire went out in February 2020, but I'm afraid Jane has not yet given me the results of that questionnaire. So that, that's going to have to be pending for the time being. Um, section of officers then. Uh, I've had no nominations for chairman. I don't know whether anybody wants a volunteer for that job at the moment or whether you'd like a little bit more notice. No, nope. David Mizell has very kindly offered to act as secretary, uh, but he's been unable to be with us this evening. 
Any other volunteers to act as secretary? I'm plodding a lonely pharaoh as treasurer. Again, if there's anybody else who wishes to take the role on, they're very welcome. We need a webmaster and we also need a diversity and inclusion officer. Um, the other committee members that have indicated their willingness to stand are Paul McGinty, Shizel, um, Steve Kaminsky, Paul S Smith and Lynn Dagg. Uh, most of those have actually been on this evening, probably still are. Um, Lynn, unfortunately, got a mess up, messed up uh, with trying to log in and uh, is not with us, although she wished to be. A number of other members have been on the committee. I don't know. I'm still waiting to hear from any of them as to whether they want to continue. And whether there's anybody that's uh, sitting listening in the audience at the moment that um, would like to volunteer. You're all very silent. I noticed most of them are, 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 are muted. And I want to say that you can actually unmute yourself if you want to speak, and uh, you um, are very welcome to comment or to participate. Right. Well, I'll pause for a moment or two while you do that. Um, well, I'm Lynn Dag, and I am here. I did get in eventually. Oh, good. good. You're well, welcome. Great. Great. And thank you for your time and help because I couldn't. I couldn't get in. Um, I. I I came on about quarter past, and it said all of the tickets for most went brightest have been closed. So it was my fault, but I've had a busy day. Apologies. Right. Well, if you don't want to unmute your microphone, then we've still got the chat and the questions. Uh, so if you want to contribute anything, you're welcome to put something in there. Otherwise, I'll um, take it that uh, the officers that have actually indicated their willingness to stand, uh, we elect them. Unless anybody's got any objections. Can I just say that I managed to unmute myself, but um, Paul's having problems with it and has indicated he would be willing to help with any roles. Good. Which, which perhaps. Paul would like to send us a chat to tell us which role he'd like to be in, or alternatively, email me um, afterwards to tell me that. Steve Middleton can't unmute in the question, any. He's in the questions and it says any. Yes. <laughs> well, I would Hi, appreciate Steve it. Steve Middleton here. I would be willing to be a committee member. Right. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any of those particular roles grab you? Right, anybody else want to uh, uh, unmute? I can see uh, uh, some, some of our audience uh, have uh, left some uh, notes in the questions. Uh, window and uh, one of them said they cannot uh, they are not able to unmute uh, uh, themselves of course the Stephen uh, Middleton uh, he's unmuted you... now oh you are uh, muted now okay so so do you want to speak about what you want to say Oh, you said that you want to uh, be a committee member. Uh, Colin, have, have you uh, uh, noted that? Yes. I, I've noted Steve Middleton's. Uh, oh, great. Wanted to be a committee great. member. Was it uh, somebody else? Or only the list that we'd got already? Sorry, I was having Colin. trouble unmuting myself. We also have Paul Smith. Happy to help yeah, I, I, it's unmuted for me as well, so I'm happy to help be on any kind of committee if I can help. Okay. 
certainly you are welcome. Would you please send a, a brief email to Colin after this meeting, you know, uh, provide a, a short description, uh, you know, not really a formal CV, but a short description of, uh, uh, you know, to introduce yourself. And, uh, uh, or if you like, you know, uh, it would be nice if you can introduce yourself to, to the meeting uh, very briefly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the quickest thing for me, I can just have a, two words now and I can ping a CV over and be the quickest thing, if that's all right. Yeah. I've met Colin a number of times formally through the, the law SG, as was when Jenny was running it. But yeah, I've, uh, I've got a background in financial capital markets. Um, I was also the sales lead on the, on the Commonwealth projects and more recently in IT. I'm also an elected councillor. So I split my time between Cambridge, where I'm from originally, and uh, Newington Green in Islington, if people know it. Uh, been obviously with the BCS for a long time. And obviously within the work I've done in IT, I was best part of about six and a half years with Autonomy and HP. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I'm also a multidiscipline certified project manager. Been around, got the scars, got the t-shirts, happy to serve in any way where people think I can add value. I, um... But I make a suggestion that we uh, we collect this meeting. We collect uh, expressions of interest and uh, details, and we'll um, have a separate specific meeting to um, appoint. Yep. Yes, I'll take it that we've got all of the names there um, that have that have said they're willing to stand, um, plus Steve Middleton. Uh, we'll form an interim committee with them. And yeah. I will um, li liaise and we'll have a committee meeting in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, next, next month. Yeah. I believe I've got email addresses for the ones that are willing to stand. I'm not sure that I have got an email address for Steve um, because BCSHQ are very fussy about not telling people anybody else's email addresses, which is a bit of a nuisance. But um, so if Steve can drop me a an email then that would be appreciated uh, you've obviously got well, mine because i sent it out in the uh, notice of meeting colin i don't know if you can hear me but i've just put my email address into the question window all right okay thank you very much oh, it's working now <laughs> it wasn't working before okay good stuff all right okay steve stephen dot middleton at home office dot gov yep Right. Has anybody got any suggestions for what we might have in future meetings? What would you like to see? Have you got some favourite topic you'd love to invite somebody to come and address us? I would like to say uh, not about the topics because we're going to come up topics now and then. Yeah. I suggest next time maybe we use a Zoom instead of this uh, go-to <laughs> webinar. Uh, you know, that will make our life so much easier uh, uh, because most of our audience perhaps already, uh, uh, they are using Zoom. Uh, so that's one suggestion we can think about it. The second is that, because now uh, uh, the talk is online, it's virtual. So we don't have to stick to this evening timetable. So in the past, because everyone uh, had their day job, so, so we can only organize the event in the evening. But now, I would assume most of us are working remotely at home. So will that make uh, everyone's life easier if we host this talk, say, in the late afternoon, say 4 p.m. or something? Uh, maybe in that way we can have more people uh, uh, you know, join us. Uh, uh, make the talk more uh, you know more welcome thanks right so the one of the questions for the committee to address is what time do we have the live session and then put it online for everybody else to watch at some other time yeah. uh, I mean that that will fit in uh, nicely with sort of some of our overseas contacts um, because at the moment in America we're looking at uh, what sort of um, just a, a very early afternoon in America, and of course over in uh, China we're looking at um, something like sort of two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So um, 
if we do vary our time, in fact, if we vary our time, it might be good that we may get some online people from other countries. Yeah, OK, I'll put that down for the committee to have a look at that one. Uh, as far as Zoom is concerned, BCS do have a Zoom license, at least one Zoom license, uh, but they, they, they tend to sort of prefer go to webinar. I've no idea why, but uh, if the uh, present audience uh, wishes to um, go for Zoom, then we'll go for Zoom. By the way, if anybody else wants to say anything, please just raise your hand because I can actually see a list of hand of names and hands. So if anybody's got anything else to say, please raise your hand now and we'll unmute you and let you see it, say it. If not, I'll waffle for a few moments and then we'll shut the meeting down. Uh, where are we? Suggest we leave as is for now, collect offers of interest in joining the committee and reconvene next month. Yep. Well, of course, one of the things for those of you that are going to be on the committee, uh, you may have noticed that BCS headquarters has a whole series of meetings coming up towards the end of January aimed at committee members. I don't expect you to attend all of them, but there may be one or two there that do interest you. Again, I'll circulate details for those of you that haven't had it. I think most of you had, though. Right, raise your hands now or forever hold your peace. 10, <laughs> 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right, well, thank you very much to Shai for, um, Shi, Shi for uh, arranging our very interesting speaker. Um, as you say, we got something just under 40 people, I think, uh, apart from the organizers actually listening. For most of the talk, um, one or two sort of joined us late and one or two uh, left early, but uh, we obviously uh, hit quite a, a useful vein of things that were interesting to people. So I look forward to organising a committee meeting and I hope somebody else will step forward as chairman because uh, I'm afraid I felt totally out of my depth in tonight's talk. Um, I mean, I retire, retired from the industry something like 11 years ago. And uh, the, the way things are developing, it seems more like sort of 11 centuries ago. <laughs> uh, Colin, I, I have I'm, a... um, Colin, I'm happy to ping you down a CB. And if you think I'm qualified, I'm happy to serve in that capacity, if it would help. Right, do, do, do please ping down, yes. I was just going to say, I think my 15-year-old grandson knows more about it than I do. Um, I've been talking to a couple of others recently, and uh, very much the younger generation is... Uh, very much more with it than we are as the older generation still it's been useful uh, i mean we're, we're sort of shielding ourselves obviously for obvious reasons uh, i'm just hoping we get through it all anyway i'll uh, thank you for your attendance uh, have a safe journey home and um <laughs> we'll see you next month thanks thank you bye thanks all right, bye. Bye. Good, good evening bye thank you